All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, MIM sintering. Are, are any questions to begin with? Anybody have any questions about anything? We're good. Um, and um, this gets into issues associated with working with metal particles instead of ceramic particles. And we've already talked about some of those issues in terms of uh, the capacity for metals to absorb and utilize carbon in terms of the final microstructure and properties, and that's, that's nice. Um, but there are also complications associated with metallic particles that we don't have with ceramics. For one, they're metals, and metals oxidize, and those oxide layers can be problematic for us in the context of, of where we need to go. And um, things that we do to try to eliminate that uh, which we'll talk about extensively involve hydrogen and um, it's it's not a magic wand it can generate its own set of problems when you use hydrogen um, so we'll, we'll get into that as well but so the sintering process though is, is similar to ceramics and that it's driven by reductions in surface energy we have to play around with grain boundaries and how quickly the grain boundaries move in these microstructures a lot of similarities as well so getting into it here because we are using metallic particles as should be obvious to guys. The issues associated with furnace atmosphere become far more critical than with simple oxide ceram ceramic injection molded products alone. Um, and this is because they're always covered by some type of oxide layer. And we're talking about cobalt chrome, we're talking about titanium aluminide, uh, we can be talking about stainless steel for that matter, which is another biomedical alloy. All these things are metals that consist of surfaces, and those surfaces will typically be oxidized. So unless we're working with platinum or gold particles, which actually people have made um, platinum-based biomedical implants. Um, crazy idea, but um, they don't do that anymore. Unless we're working with one of those two materials, we're going to be dealing with oxidation in the context of these particular materials. And so, um, these metals typically require some protection of oxidation by whatever atmosphere is used. Um, and the complication being that these oxide layers, uh, first off, they become especially important as particle size decreases. And so the example I always like to use is that uh, if you uh, go to a vendor and say, hey, I want to um, work with uh, 200 nanometer titanium, all right? And you buy that 200 nanometer titanium from these guys, you pay an arm and a leg for it. Um, and uh, first off, unless it comes to you under pure argon, it's oxidized. And if it comes to you under pure argon and you open it up, it'll probably burst into flame because all that, that titanium will oxidize instantly, uh, producing uh, potentially at 200 nanometers, maybe the entire particle ends up being oxidized. All right, but at least there's some few nanometers, at the very least, it will always be oxidized. You add aluminum into it, it's even worse. The aluminum oxidizes even more quickly than titanium. Um, and so all these things are issues that we have to work with. And uh, this set of cartoons, which as you now know is not that far from reality, uh, talks about some of the challenges here. And so um, this sort of says loose powder here, but we could, we could say this is post, in, uh, post MIM. All right, and all we need to do is say that everything in between this is polymer, all right? And that would also be an accurate cartoon, right? Everyone agree with that? Okay. And so we now know, based on the last lecture, we talked about the idea that we have more than just one organic in this blue soup that surrounds all the particles. We remove um, all of the wax, and we're left with uh, little necks of polymer that hold things together and of course what we need is get to this critical handoff. We talked about that last time so we have to be able to go from here all the way over there and what you're looking at these black lines are their attempt to say synernex. All right, and so those need to form. And if we have an oxide layer that's in between those, then you know, as some oxide sitting on the surface, that oxide either needs to be removed or it's gonna get in the way 
of the formation of those center necks. Not, it's not guaranteed that it's going to cause problems, but in many cases, especially if it's a thicker layer, it can cause problems and delay the formation of these center necks. And that can then turn around and criti um, um, compromise the whole critical handoff process. All right, if the oxide layers are there, keeping these things from gluing together by the formation of the desired center necks at this point, that whole complicated process falls apart and your part could also fall apart inside the furnace. All right, so clearly oxide layers and what they can do to our process are very important to us. And then after that, and you guys have seen you know, the cartoon for this, that um, the uh, Chariot to Fire soundtrack cartoon uh, does a very nice job of showing you this and uh, in terms of going from those necks to a microstructure and then to something that approximates a dense microstructure and um, just reminding you this is like um, this is the uh, second stage of sintering and so looking at this two-dimensional microstructure and thinking about it in three dimensions obviously the pores are still open so it's like a sponge squeezing out that that air or whatever atmosphere is in between those particles it is an air if we're talking about metals it's something else we'll, we'll get into that and then we get to this other part of it which is come back there we go and this is the third stage where we're no longer squeezing the air out because it's not a sponge anymore. All these pores are, are cut off from the surface. All right, And what we're reliant on, very critically, is diffusion along the grain boundaries. So whatever in those pores has to diffuse and somehow out here get to the surface at some point. Okay. And that, even with grain boundaries working with us, that's still relatively slow because it's diffusion. If you take those pores and you put one of them in the middle here, put a big ugly pore, uh, come back five hours later, that big ugly pore is still there, all the other ones could be gone. All right. Again, relative diffusion is very different. This is the blue one is governed by volumetric diffusion. This, these white ones, I guess you want to call them that, are governed by diffusion along the grain boundaries, which is definitely faster. We think of grain boundaries as a pipeline to the surface, all right? And we want to use that as, utilize that as much as possible, keep the grain size as small, et cetera, et cetera, all right? That, and that should be a review for you guys at this point. Everything I just said should be more or less a review. Any questions about any of this? All right, we're good. All right, so how do we get around some of these issues? This, this oxidation is clearly a problem, um, and we want to make sure that we, we don't have oxide layers there so how do we remove them and so as has been discussed for debinding anything that decreases the strength of the compact all right and this is so it's, it's in this process it's this fragile thing that we're trying to not make fragile anymore uh, especially when the binder phase no longer exists all right this critical handoff process jeopardizes the ability of the part to hold together it also puts dimensional tolerance at risk. All right, so dimensional tolerance is one of those things that you can't actually see, but you need a micrometer to measure later on. You're not unlikely to see it warp because it doesn't warp that much. It can fall apart, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about, okay, it, it stays in one piece, but the, the shape changes. You got to go back and hire a machinist and have them machine the surface or something like that so it goes back to being the right shape and make the economic decision of do I care enough to make that happen. Do you need to get some power? Okay. Okay, so um, unsurprisingly for metals, then a solution to this are reducing atmospheres, all right, meaning hydrogen. Um, there's some use of some of these carbon monoxide as well, but anyway, it's typically hydrogen. And so these are very common as they can not only protect from oxidation, so they can keep oxidation from ever occurring, which is important, especially at low temperatures, if there's any air or oxygen in your environment, but also, most importantly, to reduce those existing surface oxides. So take titanium oxide and make it into titanium. Take aluminum oxide, make it into aluminum. And that's done by extracting the oxygen by the action of hydrogen on those oxides. Whoops, come back. 
and allow for the rapid development of particle particle necking i.e. that critical handoff all right and so um, this data over here is actually OJ data which is a form of analysis that can measure the um, oxygen content as a function of depth and so this is uh, showing you this data for a titanium screw all right so relatively boring still important biomedical application these screws are used to hold pieces of bone together all right so they, they're very important in that context and uh, it's nothing special um, so, you know, it could be titanium, probably is pure titanium, could be tiolumonide, some people make it those way, that way. And what we're characterizing with this form of analysis is the surface composition. And the important thing, and the nice thing about Auger, is that depth here is measured in angstroms, all right? So a um, 1,000 angstroms is 100 nanometers. All right, so these are, we're starting out very thin and looking at it at a high level of detail. So orientation here zero depth that's our surface so that's the thing that we see when we look at that titanium screw is this just the surface whoops let's see if I can make that move up okay and so we start with that surface and then um, we look at what we measure my screen is sideways you guys can't see that but my, I can hold on I'm trying to not be tied to the podium Okay, so what we've got then, clearly, when we look at what's present at the surface, initially, there's actually very little titanium at the surface. All right, we have a titanium screw that, when you touch it, you're not actually touching titanium for the most part. All right, what we are looking at, though, first off, is a bunch of carbon, and we also have a fairly high percentage of oxygen. There's more oxygen we're touching than we are titanium. Um, what's, what's causing this carbon? Where's it coming from? No, no, this is, this is post-furnace. The binder's gone. That's a, that's a good answer, though. Carbon, yeah. Now, it's just this is OJ, so it's not exactly what the carbon is made up of, but there's a source of carbon on the surface. What is it? Um, the air. From the air, yeah. So what, what carbon sources might be going to that surface out of the air? Um, yeah, it's typically pretty clean. So basically, but this is a it's, a, it's a screw. So it's just been hanging around in the environment. So it's been hanging around near us, all right? And so we've got things floating around the air like formic acid. Uh, if someone has touched the darn thing, their fingerprint oil is all over it, all right? So this is just carbon crap that is just floating around in, in every environment. Oils maybe, oil, it depends on where you are, but oil can be a particularly difficult thing to get rid of. Um, and so this just ends up on the surface. So you know, so it's mostly that at the very, very outer edge of the surface. So the thing you might, are you most likely to touch is carbon. And this layer of carbon um, kind of dominates until you get to around 200 nanometers, ang angstroms, I'm sorry, so 0.2 nanometers, really, really thin. And then at that point, that carbon starts to drop off substantially. It's not down to zero yet. Uh, that doesn't happen until 600, but at some point now we finally start to be able to say, okay, we are now touching the titanium oxide uh, that we know coats this stuff. And that, that layer thickness runs out to whatever that is, 1,000 nano, 1,000 angstroms, so 100 nanometers of just the titanium and oxygen. And uh, it's not necessarily, uh, we always think of titanium oxidizing to TiO2, but these really thin layers, it can be a mixture of TiO and TiO2. So this, this ratio of oxygen and titanium makes some sense if that's our goal. And then finally, as we get to depths of around 1400, uh, finally that titanium becomes more prevalent than anything else. And even at 2000 nanometers, we still have some oxygen present in our system. All right, so we have this this layer of titanium oxide that we can characterize and understand and that's the, what we need to get rid of, at least to an extent that is sufficient enough to allow those cinder necks to spontaneously form as soon as the polypropylene or whatever's left of the polypropylene goes away. Okay? Any questions about that? 
And so you might think the answer to the solution to this is just, just do everything in hydrogen, darn it, and, um, and that will get rid of the oxide layers. Unfortunately, um, uh, I always like to say, you, know, you, you thought you got rid of, you thought you got, you didn't have to worry about chemistry anymore, but it turns out there's this thing called furnace chemistry that we now have to worry about. And so what's going on is if we go to pure hydrogen, then yes, that will remove the oxide layer very efficiently. However, it also removes other things, and those other things are carbon. And so this is where it gets complicated. It's not simple anymore. And so what this data is showing you, let me just go ahead and talk about that data, is a plot of a bunch of things, first off, for this uh, Fe2 nickel metal that we're trying to produce. And on the x-axis, we have hardness. All right, you guys know what hardness is. There's a hardness lab, right? You still do hardness labs? All right, so you do little in diamond and denners and make... Oh, yeah, forever ago. <laughs> forever ago. Like years ago. Like years ago, okay. All right, anything greater than six months is ancient history. Okay. All right, but we, we, can, we know how to measure hardness, and you guys, uh, you saw for the alpha case thing, you can measure it as a function of depth and so forth. So it's, it's a useful technique. And here what we're doing is basically using hardness as a stand-in for tensile properties, uh, which makes some sense. All right, hardness, resistance to indentation, tensile properties, resistance to deformation. Um, it's, a, it's a reasonable, simple way of making the point here that um, if we go to a system that is centered in pure hydrogen, all right, and then we look at the density, we're up at around 7.8, and that's pretty much 100% um, uh, dense, all right? And so that's good. So if I was a ceramist and I was making ceramic parts, I would say, oh my God, stop, you, you got it 100%, all right? You, this, you, you hit the target. But what we also see is that the hardness data is at the minimum for this plot, meaning that the properties of that alloy are not what we want them to be. All right, we got rid of all the oxide, but we also got rid of so much carbon that the mechanical properties went down. And so this is the, hopefully illustrates why we want carbon in MIM processes. We don't want to get rid of it completely like we do for CIM. We tolerate it and actually we want it and we design it to be a certain state. And so then we have that, that endpoint saying that, yes, it's wonderfully dense, but no, it doesn't have the right properties. And so then we look at other things We have 75% hydrogen, 25% argon, and fit in 50-50. Um, so we use argon and nitrogen kind of interchangeably in some of these furnace atmospheres. Uh, as you guys might remember, nitrogen is one of those things that actually modify some of the mechanical properties. So we have to be careful about where we use nitrogen. So argon is often used. Um, we also have the 50-50 hydrogen, argon, and nitrogen. And then in the end, we have this 10% hydrogen, 90% nitrogen, which is closer to what actually is used in a lot of these furnace atmospheres. And in fact, we're, we've had these design meetings this, all, all this week about uh, the, uh, they're gonna knock down um, Watts and replace it with a brand new building and totally renovate McQuig. And so we have all these discussions about what those labs are gonna look like. And one of the things we're gonna do is implement this ability to center these types of um, particulates and that's going to involve an argon hydrogen mixture about 5% hydrogen in argon and the reason why 5% is so popular is that it can't catch on fire you can hold a match to it all day long and it won't go boom like hydrogen by itself will normally go all right and so anyway so these minority hydrogen containing atmospheres are very popular and what you're looking at is um, the battle between properties and uh, density and so we can see that the, the density goes down, but in this 25%, 75%, uh, we've increased the hardness substantially. So properties have gone up. And so we may not be fully dense, but we don't care. We're at the right properties. And so this, again, illustrates the, how, how nice metals are and that you can have something that's not 100% dense, but its properties are still better than something I that is 100% dense. All right? And that's the nature of this is you know, iron to nickel really soft stuff comparatively. Where? 
O-C-O-H, O-C-O-H, high oh, you're talking about what are written? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> On the other hand, am I the only one who knows those acronyms? Why do you use acronyms in both? Like, like because you guys live and breathe acronyms and memes and never and. Heard, I've never heard <laughs> <laughs> there's and there's O T T H on the third hand if you no, want to talk. Not a, <laughs> not a good thing. Not even a thing. You just made that up. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. I've had discussions with people who said on the third hand. Really? Oh yeah. I've never heard that in my life, but I love it. <laughs> on the other hand, you've heard. Everyone's heard that, right? Yeah. I'm okay. All right. Anyway, getting back from the the world according to Nick. Um, so. Um, we have the obviously these increases in properties and uh, decreases in, in strength, but in the end, what uh, we're looking at is this 10% hydrogen, 90% nitrogen is gives us the best properties and the best density. So we would pick that to make this stuff. Does that make sense? So kind of the optimum combination. So we get the highest density because we reduced oxides with the lowest hardness. High nitrogen atmosphere has less reduction potential and is less effective at removing both oxygen and carbon, uh, which is, turns out is a good thing. We get lower densities, but higher hardness and ultimately strength. All right, yes? Is there like a, a density that's like zero, but they won't do it even if the hardness level is very Yeah, that, so this is, gets into the, the difference between hardness and tensile properties, because tensile properties will end up targeting the pores. And so at some point, your tensile properties will decrease. But as you can see here, all those densities are kind of the same. All right, so they're all pretty much good as far as the densities are concerned. But yeah, if it went to, uh, you know, like 7.0 grams per cc, that's not acceptable. Even if the, even if the hardness properties are good, the tensile properties are going to start to stink substantially. Okay, any other questions? And again, we want these to be, you know, kind of high modulus alloys. Um, so... Okay, atmosphere has complex effects. Um, and this is just showing you the same material, same alloy, and we're looking at this uh, tensile strength at one end as being around 52% um, ductility, and then at another end, we have a high tensile strength, but we have next to zero ductility. All right, and uh, what you're looking at is centered at 1200 C for one hour, and this involves these different atmospheres, and so what we end up generating is variable carbon content as a result. And so this should make some sense. You extract all the carbon, and it becomes soft and ductile, so that's the left-hand side. Uh, you leave all the carbon in, and it becomes very high strength, but zero ductility. So endpoint? The answer is it depends on your application. All right, where do you want to go with this? Do you want something that's a really high modulus or do you want something that's pretty ductile and soft? Or soft is a relative term. Again, it depends on what you're using it for. And so you get high strengths from retained carbon and high nitrogen atmospheres, which sounds good, but of course if really, really high strength, you drop it on the floor, it shatters because it has really crappy fracture resistance if there are flaws left in the material. You get high ductilities as a result of the extraction of carbon, thanks to the fact that hydrogen is really good at taking carbon out of these alloys. And uh, what we're talking about here is the fact that atmosphere controls chemistry. Um, it also controls microstructure, as you'll see, and it should make sense to you. And in the end, it also controls property. And so um, you know, last time I talked about polymers and how they are proprietary, all right? And so if you start looking at these papers, they'll say, well, we used N additive. They won't tell you which polymer they use because it's a, it's a market advantage if they have a certain polymer that works for them. And now you see papers that talk about the atmosphere as being something that we used uh, an atmosphere that was optimized for producing higher densities. So they're not going to tell you what it is because that's a market position for them as well. You know, maybe they use you know, um, argon 93% um, and hydrogen 7% and they've spent 10 years figuring out that's best for them. They are not going to let you know that. All right, because you are their competitor. And so th in this area, you know, these things become very, very important to them because they are so critical.
At high temperatures, the elevated solubility of hydrogen allows hydrogen to throw, f to freely diffuse into metals. And so this is another issue. Um, the example I, I would like to give is that there was this thing in the 90s that the guys at, at NASA in uh, Cleveland were really hot about called the National Aerospace Plane. Um, and the National Aerospace Plane was fueled by hydrogen and would take off from somewhere in the US and two hours later it would arrive in Japan, all right? And it would do that by going to uh, suborbital heights very, very quickly and then drop you off in Japan. Right now it takes it's like 19 hours to fly to Japan from here by regular commercial airliner. So this plane would get you a lot, get there a lot faster. And there are some questions about who really needs that, but anyway. Um, and so this is the idea and it's been resurrected once or twice. I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but they talk about it. But the issue is that they wanted to use hydrogen. And this hydrogen was not gas. It was called slushy hydrogen, meaning a mixture of liquid hydrogen and hydrogen that was kind of trying to freeze in the solid, which is not easy to do with hydrogen. So it's really cold, way colder than liquid nitrogen. All right. And so uh, they were using it as fuel. And uh, what they found is that when it goes from being this slushy stuff to the engine, it heats up, heats up, heats up. And at some point, it heats up enough that it just starts going right through the metal. That is the tube that con conducts that hydrogen fuel to the engine itself. It just kind of floats out into outer space. Um, and so that gives you an idea of how tiny these things are relative to the, the materials that are, are holding them. Um, and what they also found, and this is kind of well known, they can recombine in minuscule voids to form hydrogen molecules. And so we have hydrogen atoms that are diffusing through the metal. They find each other and say, oh, let's make a, make a diatomic molecule. And boom, they do that. You get enough of those guys together and you start making bubbles of hydrogen gas inside the microstructure. And so this is another risk. We don't see this with ceramics. Ceramics don't do this. Metals, they do. And they can create pressures from inside the cavity and give you reduced ductility and tensile strength. And eventually, if you really let it go that far, you can actually crack these things open. So it's like a little pressure vessel that is seeing high pressures of, uh, of hydrogen. Eventually it builds up to the point where that can crack this. Um, usually it doesn't go that far, but you are generating pores, okay? And so all of the uh, things that we care about, nickel alloys, niobium, tantalum, zirconium, titanium, they are all susceptible to this, okay? And so that means that if you started at room temperature under a hydrogen containing atmosphere and went all the way to full density, you're going to have hydrogen left behind in your alloy. It's just unavoidable. And there's also the possibility of forming these pores, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are really bad things. And so what that means is that at the higher temperatures, it must be centered either in a vacuum or in an inert gas. All right, so it means that what you're doing is you're staging this. So you stage the centering process, you have hydrogen there originally. Um, and so you need this to reduce the oxide layer. So you can't start out in vacuum or inner gas. You start out in something that contains hydrogen and you switch over later. So again, more complicated. So something else they won't tell you, they won't tell you when they make that switch. So they'll just say they, they did it. And then inert gases are insoluble in these metals and they may not close during sintering. And so um, this is the other side of the coin, which is, it's not a really a big deal, but we do know that we have pores. Those pores are filled with something. In this case, they're going to be filled with nitrogen or argon. Not a, no, it's not a huge issue, but we, we know that's the situation. So, um, but, you know, compared to hydrogen embrittlement, it's a small price to pay. Okay, any questions about that? Is that that's not something we normally talk about much, hydrogen embrittlement, but it is a real concern. Okay, any questions about that so far? All right, liquid phase sintering is also used for MIM for the same reasons. It gives us this uh, lower sintering temperatures, all right? Decreased sintering temperature means increased profit for your boss, so we can go to that Swiss chalet again, all right? So it's very important that we get a decrease in the cost of these systems. We had a discussion yesterday about a, uh, a um, a uh, skateboard garage. Oh, that be bad if you saw that oh it's something But it's if we we could put a like a cubby that people could put their skateboards in when they go into the lab. Mm. Um, anyway, um, so manufacturers will use this whenever they can. Too low of a temperature can lead to residual porosity, meaning that if the liquid phase 
cranks in too quickly, it can seal off the pores and leave pores behind in your system. Um, too high temperatures can lead to loss of shape due to gravity. And what is that? What that means? It, it, um, you just have to think back about to the debinding thing. If you have a lot of liquid phase, and gravity is acting on that liquid, it's going to try to deform the liquid. And so, if you have too much um, of this liquid phase searing additive or too high a temperature where its viscosity is decreased dramatically, then it can actually slump under the influence of gravity. All right. So of course you try to avoid this, um, and you one of the ways is to crank up the solids loading so that gravity won't do that. But you can also get come on exaggerated grain growth, which is another issue. That liquid phase can also make grain growth more easy, and then you can also get even worse distortion more subtly is differential shrinkage between the width and height directions and this issue of friction with the centering support so what I'm going to give you is a cartoon here which they actually make parts that look like this but you think of this as one of those dental posts or something like it where you have these steps in this part and this is going to be our solid that we're trying to make and it's sitting on some type of, of furnace substrate all right it's got to sit on something when it goes into that furnace and so we've got liquid phase centering going on in here as a result of it being at the furnace at some extremely high temperature and then you'll you'll see what happens is that you get shrinkage here which is more or less the same as the shrinkage there and which is the same as the shrinkage there but we get down to the bottom here and if we we zoom in on oops come on let me zoom if you zoom in on that first off you've got friction here at this interface and that friction is even worse than what I may have mentioned before because now we have a liquid and that liquid really sticks to the furnace much better than just particles alone would so friction is now even higher and so what you can do is you can restrain the shrinkage such that the bottom of the compact does not shrink like the rest of the compact does. Okay, and you can go in and measure this. Right, they, do the, they make these parts just for the purposes of measuring just how bad friction is. And what they also do, and I mentioned this before, is they, they make what's called furniture that the parts sit on. They're not chairs or couches. They are they're shapes that are designed to minimize the amount of contact so that that shrinkage uh, friction minimizes the distortion of the part. So you try to free it from actually being on the surface as much as possible while still supporting it, which is a tricky thing to do. Are there any questions about that? Whoa. What can I do? What can I, do? I can get this back. It's a mess. Anyway, um, oh, there we go. Does that make sense? So far? Okay. All right, we also have this issue of carbon control. Um, and so we mentioned the need that we have to have at least some carbon. Um, by ceramic standards, we have a lot of carbon left in these, these structures, and then the amount of carbon varies depending on the alloy. Um, and um, you know, the, what's considered excess and what needs to be eliminated depends on what metal we're talking about. You know, some metals can tolerate a lot of carbon. Um, a lot of metals need a lot of carbon because the ultimate properties rely on the ability of carbides to stop dislocations, as I keep saying. But what we also have happened in these systems is that the carbon can also react with oxygen, I, sh I need to add in here, and water. All right, where does water come from in this system? We have the oxide layer, we put hydrogen in contact with the oxide layer, it makes water. All right, so we don't actually introduce water, but inside the this complicated structure, water is formed because that's a reaction product between the oxide and hydrogen. And so that water can then produce carbon monoxide in reacting with that carbon. And you end up making pores like this one that are filled with carbon monoxide. All right, and so that's giving you a flaw. That flaw is pretty large as you can see in the structure. And so there's some question about whether it's going to compromise the properties. Does everyone see that? All right, so these are the things that happen. We, we, we throw in hydrogen and we think it's going to solve problems and it creates a whole set of other problems that we need uh, to worry about. Say again that the hydrogen forms carbon monoxide. So we have um, 
carbon can react with oxygen where it's present, but carbon reacts with water, and those two together make carbon monoxide, and then that gas is trapped inside these pores. All right. And so this is uh, going to be more of an issue when you have small particles because they have high surface areas. They begin to center at very low temperatures, and so they can start trapping pores, trapping CO. And they also have significant impurity levels, which makes everything, makes everything much worse in terms of this reaction. You OK? <laughs> Please don't inhale your coffee. <laughs> oh, not the Sorry. That's all right. OK. Any questions about this? All right, so all these little things that can go horribly wrong for us when we try to bring in something that, on the face of it, makes perfect sense. All right, so I was at a conference one year, and we were doing a lot of work on density grades, and this guy I knew came up to me and said, oh, you know, all these problems go away when you center it in the furnace. And so I spent the next two years publishing papers saying, no, they don't go away when you put it in the furnace. Um, and so, but that's a general thought, is that somehow centering is going to sweep up or clean up or mop up all the lower temperature problems. And in reality, that's not true. As you guys have seen already, it is a chemistry process that goes on when you throw things into a furnace, and um, it can be complicated. We do know that it can alleviate some issues of segregation, you know, diffuse impurity-rich areas away from themselves. We do know that it is helpful there. But we also know that density variations, and I showed you guys last time the microstructure, that create, are created at low temperatures are either not corrected by these exposures or can become even worse. They shrink away from themselves and create larger defects than were there originally, sometimes a lot larger. Um, and one, one example of this that's relevant to this particular area is we can have hairline cracks in the MIM microstructure created by the ejector pins on the component. All right, so we talked about what those are. And so we know what an ejector pin is. It's this large, narrow pin structure, all right? And it, when the part is ready to come out of the mold, you open up the die, and then you pop it out with those pins, all right? Sounds like it shouldn't be a big deal. But what can happen is that if we have our microstructure made up of wonderfully round particles with 1 7th diameter particles between them, all, both of which are round, and this is surrounded by some type of binder phase, right? And it's cooled off. It's no longer hot, the system, all right? And then at that point in the molding process, we hit it with our ejector pin. And our ejector pin is enormous on this scale, all right? But that ejector pin is this large circular thing. It hits the thing and, and pushes it out, pops it into the bin below it. And what can happen as a part of that is that we, we exert stresses on these particles, but not the other particles on the left. So that can generate potentially a crack in between these areas of the microstructure. So this is really irritating that something as boring and stupid as an ejector pin can compromise our wonderfully designed microstructure, but it's reality. We can create flaws just by the process of getting it out of the darn die. All right. Does everyone see that? All right, and so as a result, as we talked about last time, these small, even particle widths, cracks or voids will open up further rather than heal, like I told that guy at the conference, as material densifies away from the defect during solid state centering. All right, so we create a gap. One side of the gap shrinks away from the other side of the gap because they are now going toward each other. They're sitting away from that area being driven by the solid around them. We do know that liquid phase centering has some healing ability, but when you put that defect in there, it's going to require longer times to make that happen. Um, and one thing that people have tried to use is what's called vacuum centering over long periods. And uh, this is another way of trying to get um, rid of some of these flaws. But uh, as we'll talk about, this causes evaporation of specific elements. All right, and so it should make sense to you that if we have the one we've talked about many, many times before, we have titanium aluminide. All right, aluminum has a melting point of only 660 C. All right, 
And so if we're in that furnace at 1300 degrees C, there is some driving force for aluminum to volatilize out of that alloy. All right. And so that is the issue when we start talking about using vacuum. The titanium is fine, the, the cobalt and chromium and so forth are typically fine, but aluminum is a problem because we can start extracting aluminum out of the alloy and then we start changing the composition, we start changing the properties, we change the, digital, the transition temperature from, from beta to HCP. So those are all issues associated with these, these differences in temperature and differences in exposure. And then, as we talked about, even for ceramics, we know that impurities can segregate to grain boundaries and change the properties of the alloy. All right. Given time, um, especially if you've got five or six different elements in this at high temperatures, you start forming phases that you don't want. And uh, in many cases, those happen at the grain boundaries. Any questions about that so far? All right. Driving forces are the same as before. Particle bonding during sintering driven by reductions in surface area. We may start out 60% dense, 40% porous. We get significant increases in hardness, strength, utility, wear resistance, etc. Um, and um, I'm going to show you a couple of microstructures first. So this is iron, and iron can be processed by injection molding just like anything else. And so you've got these spheres, and you've got what we've been hammering you guys with the, the formation of necks and you can see where one microstructure is broken away from this microstructure and so those necks are broken also and so you can see those in this image all right iron relatively soft uh, re centers relatively easily on the other hand we have tie 64 again wonderfully round particles um, and um, again you can see the formation of necks are harder to see here between the particles but they are there and you can also see, whoops, you can also see where they've broken off because the other half of this compact has been fractured away from this. And you can kind of see that the neck character here is very different from those neck carriers, characters because of you fracturing them at room temperature. So it's brittle fracture for TIE 64 and ductile fracture for iron itself. And what you can do, so that figure 8.2 there, obviously lots of pores left behind. And um, what is interesting, some applications stop here. They're what are called oil impregnated centered bronze bushings. And so you can take metals like brass, partially center them, um, put it under vacuum, drop oil onto it, and the vacuum gets sucked in, sucks in all that oil. And then you have a piece of this, this bronze bushing that looks like brass or bronze, but has oil inside of it. And so it continuously supplies oil to uh, the lubrication process. And so you might actually stop there. But anyway, you know the next grow at compact points. We know that grain boundaries form. We know that our goal is somewhere from 95 to 100%. Um, metals, of course, as I keep saying, are more forgiving. So you might be able to stop at 95%. Ceramics, you would never stop at 95%. But metals, maybe 95% is OK, because it is a metal. Um, it's got some forgiveness. We get substantial shrinkage. And if you can get distortion, that occurs without homogeneous shrinkage because of the furnaces and so forth that these things are used in. But again, you know, so it's all being driven by this reduction in surface energy. All right. And so we often talk about shrinkage in this context. And um, again, what's focused on here is delta L over L because we can measure that relatively easily. It'd be wonderful if we could do it three-dimensionally, but we take in calibers, look at something before and after it's been densified, and we can get a delta L over L, so it's easy to measure. And what they often do is extrapolate it, assuming isotropic shrinkage, haha, -ha, we now know that's a joke, to the final centered density rho sub s. So rho sub s is equal to this post burnout state green density. All right, this is with the, the binder removed. And uh, those two relate to each other via this parameter of delta L over L naught, the initial dimensions uh, subtracted from one, and that quantity is cubed. All right, so we can figure out what we're looking at, and as a result of that relationship, plot the relation for two final densities, 95 and 100%, so the two endpoints that I just talked about a second ago, versus this post debinding density of rho sub g. And what we can see. Um, well, let's just go to the graph. 
is that we're looking at this, this competition again between initial density and shrinkage. And if you have a solids loading of 40%, we know that on this graph, and this should make sense to you by now, you're going to get the most shrinkage as a result of being at that lowest density because it's got the furthest to go. So it's got the most shrinkage in front of it. And we have these two endpoints of 95 and 100%. And uh, you know, the going to 100% requires a little more shrinkage as a result of it being a higher density. And then we start thinking about, okay, we're talking about an injection molding process. We're talking about uh, a, a furnace model driven injection molding process, meaning we try to get to as high a solids loading as possible. And so we explore these solids loadings on the X axis. And of course, if we go at 100%, then, hey, we're done. But you know, we can't injection mold that, all right? So where we typically operate, we're talking about 60, 70%. And um, you can see that if we are running at 60% uh, solids density, we have uh, a shrinkage of, what is that? Like, uh, almost 15% to 95%, and then maybe 17% to 100%. If we go to 70% instead, which is doable, I right, now know how to do that, thanks to the furnace model, then we can look at, for 95%, less than 10% shrinkage, and then a little more than 10% shrinkage, or 100% final density, okay? So that's all well and good, and it gives us an idea of um, some of the barriers in terms of shrinkage, which relate to how much frictional interactions could distort our part, for example. You know, more shrinkage, more friction, more, more potential for that. All right, so all those things are also true. But we also have to think about the, what's also going on here on the x-axis, all right? What happens to our rejection rate as we move to higher and higher loadings? Does it go up or down? So we're injection molding parts, really high viscosity slurries, right? As we move up along the x-axis here. So things get worse or better as far as rejection rate? Better. Worse. <laughs> so we go to these higher, higher viscosities, right? And so it's got to move into this complicated shape, and that becomes more difficult when the viscosity goes up. So we have, remember the terminology is short shot, okay? Meaning that you're trying to make a complex widget, and instead you only make 90% of that complex widget, and the last, the fins don't get filled in all the way. What do you do with that part? You take it out of the injection molder, pop it right back in, hopefully, if your batch allows that. All right. Um, you've just injection molded 10 parts, nine of them, throw them right back in the bin. The 10th one looks pretty good. We'll put that in the furnace and keep going. That is an option. All right. And if you make $1,000 on that part, maybe that's a reasonable thing. All right. If it was you know, plastic widgets for the pens we're all using, heck no, they want 100%. But for this, we're dealing with high value added parts, all right? So we have to deal with the fact that you know, going in this direction minimizes the amount of centering shrinkage, which is a good thing, we like that, but it also starts to maximize the rejection rate. And at some point it's gonna go 100% and nothing's gonna be the shape that we want it to be. And so we may have to back off and find something that gives you the happy minimum um, um, acceptability in terms of reject rate. So you have at least one part <laughs> being made. All right, and then balance that with the solids loading percentage, okay? So we have, you know, what's on this graph, which is the shrinkage, versus what's not on this graph, which is the reject rate that goes along with this. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Crap. Um, yeah, sorry. So everything's still given by gamma. We have to deal with the fact that we're looking at this gamma sub s. We have to think about vacancies or gas-derived atoms as a way of getting to the final density. We know that large pores grow at the expense of smaller ones because of their higher surface area. They want to become one, of big, one big pore. And the grain body diffusion is still the way of getting to the final density. We want flow of vacancies or gas atoms and then mass flow into those pores. We must control the grain structures and um, the system itself wants to eliminate grain boundary surface energy regardless of what we want, all right? It tries to eliminate grain boundary surface energy by growing the, pore, the growing the grains and making them bigger. And so 
Those grain boundaries serve as vacancy gas atom sinks during pore elimination. We want them to go there. Uh, we want these boundaries to stay stuck onto the pores. The pores must be mobile as well, so you don't want to heat too quickly because if you do, you'll leave the pores behind. Uh, if you heat too slowly, on the other hand, you get surface diffusion, which as we know does not increase density, and we also know that it consumes the driving force for densification, so this is the same story as ceramic injection molding. We want to use that, that energy in the right way, that surface energy elimination needs to be used. So you go to rapid heating to a temperature where bulk transport mechanisms become active, cause can, and if you go too quickly, then you can break away from the pores. So you want, you want some um, fast heating, but not too much, because if you go to too high temperatures, then those grain boundaries become too mobile and the pores get left behind. So it's a question of, of fast centering versus too fast centering. Um, so the ideal is rapidly heat at low temperatures and then slow the heating at intermediate temperatures. All right, so use up the energy where it needs to be used up, but not to the point where you start to leave pores behind. And this is just showing you this microstructure associated with things are good here. On the left-hand side, the pores are all on the grain boundaries. Middle is not too bad either. Pores are still more or less all on the grain boundaries. That's where we want to be. This last one, I don't think we have a grain boundary in the picture. All right, whoops. All the grain boundaries are miles away from here. And so we left pores behind inside the grains. And so, you know, you want to be somewhere where we know that the, they're sitting on the grain boundaries. All right, grain growth is unavoidable, all right, especially for metals. So grains grow in ceramics. They grow even more easily in metals, unfortunately. Um, and this is just showing you something for copper powder. Again, one of those wonderful things, you, you can dry press copper powder and it comes out of the dye. It's this beautiful, shiny copper thing. You can bounce it off the wall and it stays in one piece because um, it's a metal and it's easy. The uh, relationship between centering and grain size shown here. We have a certain density. We have a certain grain size. We start down here below two and we have somewhere stage one is here and then we start getting into stage two. All right, we know that's where centering shrinkage is easy, um, but at the same time, we're also getting these increases in grain boundary size. And then we get into the third stage, and we can kind of see that as a change in the slope of the center density as a function of thermal exposure. So we shut off the pathways to the surface, and now we're, we've gone to, at most, 12 micron size grains, which is still pretty small in the scheme of things, but this is just illustrating the trade-off between thermal exposure and grain size. Atoms at the grain boundaries have higher energies in their bulk components, so the system wants to eliminate them. The system doesn't care what you want, it's going to try to eliminate these grain boundaries. As we, we would, it would be a huge driving force to not allow that to happen. Um, grain boundaries lost during the pores greatly inhibits densification, all right? Slow intermediate heating is best to preserve grain boundary surface area. So stop thinking about this microstructure as being composed of solid particles. Instead, think about it as being a web of grain boundaries. And you want that web to be as extensive as possible, to be as high a surface area as possible, because that gives you the best transport. And so where it's possible, they will use grain growth inhibitors to keep that web nice and tiny and very dense. Okay. Any questions about all that? All right. Hopefully I'll have the exams graded by Monday. No. Oh, you want to reschedule that as well? <laughs> uh, and we can talk about those yeah, sometime next week. All right, see you on Monday.